God, as, as we worship you, as we lift your name up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, again, we want to thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Many of you are joining us online, and we're so, so glad that you've chosen to join Family Life as we worship this morning. And for everyone here in the house of God this morning, we're, we're getting more and more people each week, and it's exciting to see some new faces. And, and so, yeah, we're excited about that, and you're excited too, okay? And um, it's just awesome to be here as we worship the Lord together, uh, you know, as we, as we celebrate him, and really as we come just to, to get, bring all of our cares and concerns to him. It's so awesome. Uh, let me give you a few quick announcements as we get started this morning. First of all, here in the next two weeks, we're starting all of our small semester, fall semester life groups. We'll have a, a, a men's Bible study right here on Wednesday evening, and one on Saturday morning, we'll have a ladies Bible study uh, right here on Wednesday evening and I believe Thursday morning. We have Financial Peace University that's going to be taking place. Uh, you know, I was, I was talking with a gentleman this week and, and uh, he said, man, I'm just not good with money. And I said, well, have you ever taken the financial class? He said, no. And I said, well, that's why you take a financial class if you're not good with money, right? And it's kind of interesting, but if you're not good with money, it, never, it doesn't matter how much you make. It'll all be gone. And uh, I feel the slides flashing before me. I'm just kind of rambling. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of, uh, I may be skipping the order here. We're having a water baptism on October 11th. We were supposed to have one the week that kind of COVID shut everything down. And, and I have people asking me, hey, when are we going to have a baptism? And, and so I'm like, hey, if people want to get baptized, I'll get in there with them. You know, I'm not, I'm not scared. I'll wear a mask, gloves, and a scuba suit, you know. I'm not, I'm not scared at all. I'm not scared. But we'll put some chlorine in the water. And if you want to be baptized, uh, you know, now is, now is a great time, you know, just to wash away the old life. And, of course, we have, we have our growth track today right following the service. Uh, I, was, I was so amazed, you know. Uh, so many people are, are, you know, are watching from home, and we understand that. We're not putting any pressure on that, but... I was just surprised at how many new families have started uh, coming to family life since this time. And, and so we're excited about that. I think we had five or six new families that are joining the Grow Track. And so uh, we, we, we'll just keep building that and doing and, and working on that. And, and uh, you know, you, the, the, the church is eternal. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It's still going. And uh, I, I, uh, I was reading there was this statistician that works in the, in the, with churches and a few years ago, he put out a book saying that the church was going to cease to exist. And I'm like, okay, I'm no longer going to support you. I'm no longer going to read your stuff because apparently you have not read the Bible. The church is not going away, you know. Now, it may change a little bit, and that may be a good thing because Jesus said he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And if you look at your neighbor, there may be a wrinkle right there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't look, don't look. So anyway, we're excited. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting, I'm continuing a series that we started last week, and we do have uh, free t-shirts out there for you in the foyer if you want one, the We Over Me. Started a new series last week called We Over Me, and it's letters of hope from the book of Revelation and of the seven churches in Asia Minor, and we're going to get to those a little bit today and dig, start digging deep next week. But in this series, we're looking uh, specifically at the church and our attitudes and our perspectives and our thinking uh, regarding the local church. And, you know, in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been a growing trend uh, in, in America, uh, you know, to where many people are not viewing the church the way Jesus views the church. And this is not popular in church. This is not popular in our society, but we have to quit saying, well, I think this, well, I believe this, and we have to start washing our perspectives, our thinking with the word of God. It, it doesn't matter what Terry thinks. It matters what Jesus said in the Bible that I should think, okay? And so we have, we have to do that. And if we run church by our feelings, our emotions, it'll be a weak, deluded church, and, and that doesn't help anybody. Amen. 
So anyway, let me give you, if you missed last week, it's online, you can go check it out. But let me, uh, let me give you just a quick synopsis. Uh, we laid a, a biblical foundation for this series. And first of all, uh, that the, the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, Jesus refers to the church as his bride and that he's coming back one day at the, at the end of time here. He's coming back for his bride. And we're going to be united with him. It's going to be a grand it's going to be a grand celebration. Now, since I've been a pastor, I told you last week that when I was a, growing up, I always tried to get out of weddings. No teenager, want, no teenage boy wants to go to weddings. I just want you to know that. They're not happy about it. They're not excited about it. And so, but when I was a pastor, now I'm having to do all these weddings and, and I don't know anything about weddings. So Tracy knows all the particulars and, and I'm trying to memorize her formulas. Okay, the, 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 the grooms, they, they sit on this side, the bride sit on this side and all this. And she's like, Terry, how do you know so little about weddings? I said, well, I never went to one, you know? I went to ours, you know? That's about the only one I remember. And I don't remember that one so well anymore, you know? But the bride, the church is the bride of Christ and he's the groom, we're the bride. So think, think about that. That the church is the institution, or you could say it's the tool that God uses to reach the world. Now, God uses us individually to help people, to pray for people. But when individual Christians come together and we unite our resources of time, of energy, of finances, together we can do a whole lot more than we could individually. And you know, this church has done some incredible things and it's not because of me, but it's because of we, because we have partnered to plant churches in India and in Honduras and in Mexico and we've, we've invested in that. And the third thing is that Jesus is passionate about the church and he, the Bible says that he gave his life up for the church. And if you give your life for something, it's because you believe in it and emphatically. Uh, the fourth thing is that God intends every believer to be involved in a church family. Now that creates some problems for some. And the, the last thing is this, but the church is not perfect and this creates a problem for us. And if you think about it, no area of your life is perfect. No area. No area. And so we have to work to bring perfection into areas of our lives. And, and many times that talks about, that means that we have to lose our selfishness and our pride. But think about this with me for a minute. God's plan was to take a bunch of sinners and put them together as the foundation for building his kingdom. I mean, you ever thought, I mean... You hadn't said it out loud, but you ever thought, God, this was your plan? Like, this, 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 this was your plan? But it, as crazy as it sounds, it's actually a beautiful picture. God takes messed up, broken people, and he redeems them and restores them, and he uses them to reach other broken people. I mean, when you're broken and God heals you, you're better equipped to, uh, to, com to empathize with other people who've been broken by life. I mean, life has a way of breaking us down and Jesus has a way of restoring us and mending us and making, and making us whole. I briefly gave my testimony last week and my testimony is this. My dad was a pastor, so I was raised in church and uh, I saw all the great things that were accomplished through church. I saw the ugly side of church. And as I started to get older, 17, 18, 19, I just, I began to focus on what was imperfect about church instead of what was right about it. If you ever do that in any area of your life, you focus on the negative, you're in trouble. You're, you gotta focus on the good things. And I was 17, 18, 19 years old and I saw some ugly things in, in church and so there was a period of my life, it didn't last very long, but there was a period of my life where I, I just didn't wanna have anything to do with the local church. And my idea was this, you know, Jesus, I love you, and I love the concept of the church, but I don't want to deal with crazy in church. That's the people. You deal, if you're in the people industry, you understand what crazy means, right? It's like, you can't make this stuff up. I just can't, you know. And so I asked Jesus, I was asking him, Lord, Lord, I love you. I want to serve you, but I don't really want to be involved in church. Is that okay with you? Have you ever asked something, God, something, is it okay if I don't participate, if I don't do this? And, but you know in your mind it's not right, 
Like, you know, it's not, you know, that conversation is never going to end well, you know, with, with, with God. And, and uh, so I was just, I was battling, battling this. And then on top of that, I felt the Lord calling me to be a pastor. And, and so th- that's a dilemma. You really want me to do this, but I don't want to do this. And I'm really asking for a, an acquittal here, you know. I'm really asking for a stay of execution, you know. I'm asking for this. And one day the Holy Spirit spoke into my life, as only the Holy Spirit can do, and he just, he shook my world. That's what the Holy Spirit says. The Holy Spirit said, Terry, your problem, that that conversation never goes well when it starts with your problem, you know. Your problem is that you're living life with a me perspective instead of a we perspective. Everything you're complaining about, everything you don't like, every reason you don't want to be involved in church is all because of you. It's all about you. And you need to change from a me perspective to a we perspective so you can have a perspective that involves him, Jesus. And if you think about it, we're all guilty of this, all of us. I mean, this series is so practical, and every one of us can look in the mirror. All of us, it's very easy for all of us to fall into a me perspective of living, where we're only thinking about me. I I remember this this morning, and this is gonna show my age, and that's fine. When I was a teenager, you can look this up, you can Google, this will be good. There is a a rapper, he's probably still around, called LL Cool J, LL Cool J. And he wrote a song called Me, Myself, and I. And that was the word, me, myself, and I. And that's the me perspective. When we're worried about my desires, my wants, my selfishness, my agenda, my way of doing things, that's a me perspective. When you get a we perspective, it just means that you're open to new ways of doing things. You're open to new ideas. You're open to working with people who just aren't exactly like you. And again, I keep saying that I hate where our society is going today. If you watch news, it's like, if you don't agree with somebody, you're going to get out, to go out there and get in a fight or burn something down. And that's, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You know, you can disagree with, with somebody and not be disagreeable. We'll say, well, how do you do that? Well, start by smiling. Start by not criticizing them. And so Jesus came. This is the whole story of the Bible. Jesus came to destroy the me perspective and replace it with a we perspective. That life is never just about me and what I want. It's about other people. It's about building his kingdom. It's about working with other people. If you have a me perspective, you'll, you'll be lonely and you won't get very much accomplished. So the church only works the way that God intend, intended it to if we have a shift from the me perspective to a we perspective. When we become focused on unifying under the we banner and building the kingdom of God. And so this series, it applies to every area of our life. Sometimes there's a, a, uh, a me perspective in our marriages, in our careers, you know, in our family, in church. And we're, we're specifically talking about church because I really feel like God, God wants to, God wants his people to get a fresh vision of, of what he wants the church to be and what he wants his church to accomplish. You may be watching, you may be watching online, and the reason you're watching online is because you like, you're like me. You love Jesus and you love the concept of the church, but you don't want to rub shoulders with people in the church. And so God's going to deal with you this morning too. So anyway. <laughs> I have to get on the online people because if I get on people here, they may actually leave, you know. So if, if you tune out, I don't even know it. But, but th- think about this with me. Have any of you, I'm just trying to include all of us this morning. Have any of you ever gone to a family reunion? And you leave the family reunion, you walk to the car, and there's just silence for a little bit because you don't even know what to say. You know, you take a picture and you put it in the encyclopedia for uh, dysfunctional, right? <clears throat> so it's not perfect. Your family's not perfect, but you still love them. And the kingdom of God and the church is people coming from every walk of life. They're at different places in life. Some are still broken, getting healed. And, but that, that, that's, that's the picture. It's not perfect, but it's a beautiful thing. It's not perfect, but we can work to, together to accomplish great things. It's not perfect, but it can help us to, to deal with some of our thoughts. So what I want to do this morning, 
Um, I, want to, I want to take you uh, to a, a story in the Old Testament that, talk, that, that literally shows this me perspective messing people up. And then we're going to go to the New Testament and look at how Jesus brought uh, the we focus back in the church. And it's, it's, a, it's a famous story, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 9. <clears throat> It's the story of the Tower of Babel. And let's read this. It says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there, and they said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city. Now, ourselves really means a bunch of me's, right? Let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And here's a good thing. Whenever we think too much of ourselves and we think we're getting up here, just remember God always has to come down to look at what we're doing, right? And um, the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. If, if, if you've never thought that the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the Old Testament, it is. Let us go down. Who's God referring to? The Trinity. Um, and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from, over the, from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city, and that is why it's called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So let's talk about this for a minute. In Genesis chapter 9, it's what, we, what is referred to as the Noahic covenant, the covenant between God and Noah. After the flood, Noah's disembarking, he comes off the ark, he builds a, uh, you know, a, a um, My mind went blank. He builds an altar there and he, he, he makes, meets with God and God tells him this. I want you to, to be fruitful. I want you to increase in number and I want you to fill the whole earth. That was the covenant that God had with Noah. So God had an outward focus for the world. Repopulate the world, be fruitful, increase, scatter. I'm, I want people all over the world. But you know what I've learned in regular society in the church, we don't like to be dispersed. We don't like to be di- diversified. We, in church, we call them, we like our holy huddles. In the world, we like our cliques, where we just, have you ever gone somewhere where you didn't know anybody and you weren't included? It doesn't feel good, but yet we do that to other people. And, 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 and so, you know, this, this, the whole point here is that is that at Babel, the focus was on commonality. Commonality, it was an inward focus. They had a common language, a common culture, and a common perspective. So let's do something to keep us all here together. Because me doesn't want to lose we right here. You know, we have everything together, we're getting along. Let's do something to keep us here. If we don't, we're going to eventually be scattered all over and we're going to lose uh, contact with each other. So it was an inward focus built on commonality. And so God dispersed them by confusing their language. and And he spread them out and he diversified them to populate the earth. Now, see, this is, this is the me over we mentality. You know, it, it appears to be we focused, we want to do something together, but really it was let's do something together so me, me is okay. We don't want to spread out. I don't want to lose my friends. I want to stay here with this group of people, and, and that, that is not really what God wants us to do. So one of the biggest problems in the kingdom of God and one of the biggest problems in church today is that we choose to gather on commonalities and superficial similarities. Just like Babel, we want to gather with people who are just like us, who look like us, who talk like us, and who vote like us. It got really quiet in here. It got really quiet in here. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. 
And you say, well, you know, that's not how fame and life is. No, because we, we've done some things to, to prohibit that. But I had a friend of mine, and he said, man, Terry, I need to find a church. And he lived in a different part, in a different area. And I said, well, I went to his house. I said, man, there's a church right there on the corner. He said, I can't go to that church. He said, why? I said, why? He said, because we don't homeschool our kids. I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? He said, no, that's the homeschool church. I, lo- I looked at the sign. It's like, that Second Baptist and, you know. Now it's the homeschool church. They have 75 people and all, everyone that goes there homeschools their kids. And if you don't homeschool, you're kind of, you're not welcome. I said, well, that's a good reason. God wants you to go blow that up. Just go blow that up. Go, go take your heathen public school kids in there and just blow it up, you know. That, that's, we think that sounds funny, but we do that, don't we? We get comfortable in church. That is why only 7% of churches in America are multicultural. Because 93%, we want to meet around common, commonalities and superficial things. People just like, just like us. I, was, I, was, I met a pastor a few years ago, and he said, man, Terry, I love my church, but we have 85 people, and we've had the same 85 people for 15 years. We look the same. We, you know, visitors come, they don't stay. Can you help us out? I can give you some ideas, but... I may make you mad if I give you some ideas. He's like, no, your church is multicultural. You've got everything. We just have one group of people. I want you to tell me what the secret is. I said, okay. So uh, so what are y'all doing Wednesday? We have prayer on Wednesday. I said, what do y'all pray about? Oh, I said, yeah, it's very important. We're, this is a few years ago. So we're praying that the Republican candidate wins the presidency. That is why you're all white. I said, do you understand that a lot of people think differently from you and, and, and that's okay? You can't do things that are going to ostracize half the population. He said, well, what do you do? I, I, we, do we just gather and we pray for our country. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't hang any of my hope on any political leader. Not one. My hope is on Jesus. Okay? And it's, but, 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 so, so they got mad at me. Well, you know, this is well, you asked me to help you. I'm trying to help you. If you don't do anything different, you're going to have the same 85 people in 10 years, maybe, maybe less because some of them are getting older. And they still have the, most of the 85 today, okay? Another pastor called me and says, hey, Terry. He's like, hey, man, uh, can you help us? Yeah, so I don't, I don't know. He said, listen, we want to figure out how to get white people in our church, and you're white, so we need you to come. You can't make this stuff up, right? Just pastors are blunt when they're talking to themselves, you know. We're scared of people leaving, you know. But anyway, so I said, okay. And so I went to the church service. They were having a special service. I went to the church service. And I said, okay, I know what the problem is. And he said, what? I said, well, your your church service is pretty wild. And I think that if, you know, just a normal white person walked in there, they may be a little scared. Well, we can't grieve the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, I'm just, you said you wanted white people, and I'm saying you just need to tame it down a little bit. Just a little bit, okay? And so it turns out they really didn't want white people to come. They're still running up and down and down. I'm trying to give you an idea that, you know, God wants a church to be diversified. He wants everyone coming together and worshiping together. You know, similar to what, we, we, what we're doing here, he wants that, and that can only happen if we're not looking at superficial commonalities and we're putting we over me. Anytime we enthrone me, it limits what you can do and how God can use you. You know, if a church is me-centered, uh, you know, God, how is God gonna use that church to reach the different uh, people within their, even within their community? Now let's go to Acts. Again, a famous passage, Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Now get that, it's from every nation. It's the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is one of the main feasts in Israel, which means people, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of people would have filled into Jerusalem from all different parts of, 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 of the world, the Mediterranean world. And it says, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamph Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jew and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Now, I have a question to ask you. In my life, I've been around some drunk people. And normally, they can't speak their own language. I have never met a drunk person who can automatically just start speaking a different language. If you meet them, if you, you know, if you, I would like to inter, you to introduce me to them, okay? So that, that's just a, re, a ridiculous statement. They weren't drunk. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Acts 2, verse 40 through 44, it says, with many, this is Peter speaking now. All this happened, and Peter begins to give a bold declaration of the gospel. It says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles and all the believers were together and had everything in common. I want to read that again. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, this is not just the, the, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. We, we read all the nations and tongues that come in, and all these people, they're getting saved, and they have everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in their temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. This is an astonishing occurrence. The church goes, and one day it goes from commonality to diversity, and everyone is getting along. See, the focus has gone from what they have in common to who they have in common. See, at, ba at, at Babel, it's what they had in common, our culture, our language, our heritage. And now in, the, in, in Jerusalem, all these people are coming from everywhere. They don't have, their cultures are different, their languages are different. And, but it, but it no long, it's no longer about what they have in common. It's about who they have in common. And when we, when we have Jesus in common, we should be able to overcome any barrier that the world throws us. Any barrier, is, it's no longer about me, it's about we looking to he, and it's about who we have in common, not what we have in common. So God is reversing the curse of Babel. God scattered the people of Babel because of what they had in common, and now he's bringing the church together based on who they have in common. And, and what the early church was saying is, more than I want me and more than I want we, we want he. We want to be focused on him. So now, now we're going to move to the churches, the seven churches in Revelation. And I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about it this morning. And then we're going to dig deep over the next three to four weeks. And so I want to start with this. If you go to Revelation 2, Revelation 2, chapter 2 and 3 are, uh, it, it records the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And they all start the same way. So we're going to start with this. Revelation 2, 1, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. So it's written to the church in Ephesus. Revelation 2, 8, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write. It's written to the, the church of Smyrna. Revelation 2, 12, to the angel of the church at Pergamum, write. So to the church of Pergamum. So uh, each letter starts the exact same way. They're written to a specific local church, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Sardis, Laodicea. And so there's an oral tradition at this time. 
And here's what the oral tradition uh, said. Of course, many people couldn't read. So these letters that John was writing, they would be circulated to the churches and they would be read publicly by the pastor. Now, here's a funny thing. They would read their own letter. Then they would also read the letters circulated to the other churches. And, you know, these letters are, are pretty interesting because they, they, they list the good things the churches are doing, but they also list the ugly, right? Now, how would we feel if the Apostle John wrote a letter to family life and I read it to you, then it has to go to the church down the road, the, the church that took some of your members, you know? And, and when, when they're reading the bad things, they're like, oh, that's family life right there. I'm telling you, that's family life, you know? So, uh, so, but think about this. But what this shows, what we, this shows that God is just not concerned about the universal church, churches everywhere. He is concerned enough to write a letter to specific churches. He loves family life just like he loves uh, Oak Lake Baptist Church right over here. You know, Sugar Land Family Church over here. All these different churches around. He loves, he loves all of us and he's, he's concerned that we're doing what we need to be doing. And there's usually good and there's usually, there's usually bad. So the purpose of this series is not to paint a picture of the church that's inaccurate. Uh, that, that church is perfect because it's not. But here's the question. If we answer this question, it'll change how you view church. It'll change whether you want to participate in church. Here's, here's the question. How do we love the church in spite of its imperfections? How does God love the church? In, when, I mean, sometimes I know we need to do better, but how, how does God love us when we're not doing everything we need to be? So if God can love us, if Jesus is, still cares about the church, how, how can we love the church despite its imperfections? And um, Revelation, what Revelation teaches us is how to filter our view of the church in a healthy way. You know, really life, all of life is really about how you filter it. Something bad happens, well, how do you filter that? How do, what's your filter for that, you know? Someone betrays you, well, what, what's your filter for that? And so really life, we all have good and bad things happening, but how do we filter that? And Revelation teaches us how to filter our perception of the church how much Jesus loves the church, how he wants us to be involved in the church, how we can make a difference in the church. Now, let me talk about a filter. What do filters do? Not a trick question. Filters just, they filter out things so it keeps, it keeps the, the component clean. We all have, we all have air conditioning f filters in our home. Some of you need to go home immediately and change yours, just begging for a clean filter, right? But it collects all the dust and all the particles and all the things so that they, it doesn't go in the a AC unit. We have filters on our car, you know, air filters, you know, oil filters. Um, one, one day I was mowing my grass, was mowing my grass, and my mower just started just bogging down, and I was mad at the mower, you know. I'm like, hey, it's only two years old, you know, the mower should work. I paid this much money for it. And uh, so I took off the little side filter, and it was totally covered with grass and dirt and everything. Amazing thing. I took the filter out and I washed it and I put it back in and I mowed the yard. It ran perfectly. The filter did its job. The filter did its job. It kept the dust and grass and particles from getting inside of the engine. And so all of us, we need a filter for our lives. If you don't have a filter for your life, all the junk and grime and hate in evil, in criticism that goes on around us, it will get inside of you if you don't have a filter. We have to have a filter. So the question is, what is your filter? How do you filter things? And we're gonna, we're gonna answer that question for you uh, here in just a minute. So let's go back to Revelation. Revelation, it's a type of literature called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic, that's the genre. And so of course the whole Bible is literature. Uh, but you read it differently depending upon the literature that it is. For example, uh, you know, there's some books of the Bible that are historical. It's historical literature. It's laying down the history of the nation. And, and so 
we read that one way. Other, other, uh, other parts of the Bible are poetic, you know, and, and poetic lit- literature. And uh, this is apocalyptic. So apocalyptic literature, it basically speaks of future events or things to come. Uh, future from where they are right here when this is being written. And it's filled with imagery. It's, it's incredible imagery. And, and uh, some of it's literal and some of it is figurative or symbolic. So I want to read Revelation 1, verse 9 through 18. So we're starting right before uh, John writes the letters from Jesus to the church. It says this, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I, when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Among the lampstands were was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Uh, In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. What a a glorious, what a glorious description of Jesus. And it's, again, there's a lot of imagery. It's almost like John can't handle what he's seeing. He can't handle in his natural life, he can't handle this picture of Jesus in the throne room. And so uh, I read that for a purpose and I'm reading a lot of scripture today and they all have a purpose because I'm building us up to where we can start digging into the letters uh, next week and really have a foundation. So right after this glorious picture of Jesus, Jesus speaks to John and, and, and tells him to write these letters to the seven churches. So it's very interesting. We have this incredible picture of Jesus, John chapter one. Then in Revelation two and three, we have kind of an interlude as John writes these letters to the churches. And every letter to the churches starts with an element, a picture of the nature of, of, of Jesus's character. It starts that. But then we're gonna skip to Revelation four. So there's this, Glorious picture of Jesus, the letters to the churches. And then in chapter four, it goes, it picks right back up in the throne room. Revelation four, verse one and five, it says, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there, had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that, that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. Uh, they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And it's very interesting, it's very interesting to me that we have a vivid, glorious description of Jesus in in Revelation 1. We have this interlude, Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, which are filled with a lot of practical stuff. Then in chapter 4, it goes back to the throne room in this glorious uh, picture of Jesus. And, And this is what I think it's saying if we are to ever catch a vision of the Christ-centered church, we have to first have a vision of Jesus. We have to first, that's the, the greatest problem is people are filing into church every week 
and they're coming for what they can get out of it or if they feel like coming, instead of coming because we are coming to worship the resurrection, the resurrected Jesus Christ who's victorious, he's all powerful, he has every solution to our problems. If you come to church with a revelation of who Jesus is, it will change the way you act in church. It will change how you feel. It doesn't matter who the worship leader is. It doesn't matter who the pastor is. It doesn't matter who's doing children's church. When you have a picture of Jesus and who he is and his glory, it will change you. And we have watered down church so much. It's been about entertainment and cuddling Christians so they don't get their feelings hurt. Listen, Jesus wants to hurt some of your feelings. He wants to get you where you need to be so he can use us to do what he has called us to do. I mean, are we coming to church in awe of who we're coming to worship? You know, are we coming with a picture of man? Jesus has saved me, he's redeemed me, he's sweeping back together, and he's coming back for me. I'm just gonna come and glorify him today. I am gonna come to lift his name up, and it, it doesn't matter who else is with me. I can get along with him because I have Jesus in me. I can overlook some of my wants, some of my desires, some of my selfishness. Vision is instrumental, vision is instrumental. A church's success hinges on how central Jesus is in that church. That's it. We, we have made church about how many people come, how big the facilities are, how successful it looks to the world, uh, how big the budget is, what I'm in charge of. None of that is the best indicator of success. None of that is. The indicator of success is Jesus at the center of the church. Is everything the church does, does it wrap around that Jesus, he, he's the groom, he's in charge, and, and he has a vision for us to do. And I, I think that because we live in Houston, so we have a lot of large churches around. I want you to understand that 80% of the churches in America, 80% of them have less than 200 people. The average size of a church in America is 78 people. And so there are a lot of really small churches. And what I'm, what I'm going to say is there's a lot of really successful small churches because they're focused on Jesus. They're foc you don't have to be a mega church to be successful. Uh, I, I was, this pastor that I know, he was speaking at a conference one time. And he said, I, I, he said I'm going to tell you all something, but it may not be good news for a lot of you. He said, I was praying one day and the Lord told me, I'm not gonna say his name, but I am not happy, I am not pleased with your church. He said, well, Lord, we have 2,000 people coming. He said, I am not pleased with your church. So it kind of took him back a little bit. He's like, well, what's wrong? He says, your church has become weak and deluded and it's all about entertaining people. He says, I want you to bring church back to me. Back to, you, you put me at the center. You, you start changing the way you preach. Listen, you can, you can preach on Jesus. It's still about full of grace. I mean, I, I, I've challenged you a little bit this morning. I haven't made, I haven't taken anyone out the woodshed and just made you feel bad about yourself. You know, I, I mean, I'm challenging us as a church. We have to change our perspective. It has to be about Jesus. And he said, well, Jesus, we've built this big building and if, if I change some of these things you're wanting me to do, we're gonna lose a lot of people. We got mortgages to pay and, and he's telling all these other pastors this and Jesus said, that is not my problem. You veered away from, I never asked you to go there. You went there on your own. And so he did, he got in front of his church and said, look, I need to ask for your forgiveness. We've made church about, we've made so many things a priority that shouldn't be a priority. We're bringing this church back to focus where Christ is the center and the word of God is the center. I may change the way I, I preach and I may change some, anyway. So you say, well, what happened? Well, he lost 60% of his church, 
And uh, he's like, Lord, you know, I'm going to be in the unemployed pastor line here before too long. What happened is, so what about the 40% of the church? That's where they wanted the church to be there anyway. They, they came when Christ was the center of that church. So they lost 60% and it evened out and they started building back, but they started building right. They started reaching new people for Christ. Lives started to be transformed. So very, very important. So our church success depends on how central Jesus is in the church. Now, let's take it one step further. I want to include everybody here this morning. Our attitudes toward church show how central Jesus is to us. That's a hard pill right there. I mean, think, think about that for a week. I mean, a lot of times we shake our head and then we go home like, oh, that really caught me a little bit. Our attitudes about church. When, when I was 18, 19 years old and I had attitude problems toward the local church, uh, that just showed how central Jesus was in my life. And Jesus said, no, that's not right. You need to come back to me. You need to get your heart right, attitude right. So everything, here, here's the whole point of today's message. I, I, I told you that whatever we use as our filter will determine how our lives go. And so the conclusion the conclusion is this. Everything needs to be filtered through Jesus. The worship team can come on up. Everything needs our frustration. In, in life, not just the church, in every, in our marriage, in dealing with things in our career, everything needs to be filtered through a Jesus filter. Our frustrations, our disappointments, our expectations. If Jesus is not our filter, then our flesh will be. And if your flesh is your filter, you're going to be angry, you're going to become bitter, you're going to become resentful. So if Jesus is not central in your life, here's the thing, you're not going to be happy with anybody. If Jesus isn't your center, a new wife isn't going to help you. A new church is not going to help you. You can do the math and keep going down the areas of your life. I don't, that's all I'm going to go, okay? So in conclusion day, we're talking about me over, we, we over me. We over me. And, and how to shift our thinking, how to shift our perspectives. And although this lesson applies to every area of our lives, we're specifically talking about the local church. And the very first, the very first step to put we over me is we have to make sure that Jesus is the center of our lives, that Jesus is the center of our, of, of our church, and that everything that's flowing through our lives, through our minds, is filtered through Jesus. See, when everything is filtered through Jesus, he keeps the inside of us from being polluted. He keeps all the ugly particles and dust and rejection. He keeps it away from your heart. See, Jesus filters things so that our heart stays clean. Would you stand with me this morning? And would you just bow your heads? Would you take a moment? Just take a moment and talk with the Holy Spirit and, and ask this. Jesus, how does this message today apply to me? Are there some areas of my life that I've, I've, I've enthroned me over we and over Jesus? Father God, we come before you. Just raise your hands with me. Father God, we come before you. And probably every one of us in this room, we have seen areas of our life that we know aren't in proper order with what you want. Instead of we, we have a me perspective. Lord, maybe we've been filtering things through how we feel, through our emotions, and not through God's word. Lord, today we repent. We ask that Jesus... Lord, we, we install Jesus as the filter for our lives, for our minds, to keep our hearts pure. God, please forgive us when we've been selfish. Please forgive us when it's been about me, my desires, my wants, my needs, my way of doing things. And God, I pray today that you're, you're diversifying family life, even from what it is, Lord God, so that we can reach more people in our community so we can help more people around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.
So I promise you next week we're digging deep into Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, but I've been building it up. Hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed this. And let, let's worship the Lord just for a moment. You'll be dismissed after this song. Thank you so much, everyone who's joined us online and everyone's here. We're so glad and thankful that you're here. You've joined us today.